All right, now you're on video, so start behaving. Um, all right, um, last time we, we introduced the essay writing. Uh, I know that uh, uh, some of you have started, or most of you, I guess, started thinking about topics. Uh, as I said to, to some of you, I would be happy to discuss it during the breaks uh, today, but uh, Perhaps the best way is to send me an email with your proposition, then I could give you sort of a, a more thorough feedback if you have uh, an ID, and I can uh, maybe also provide some, some advice on, on sources and things like that. So um, uh, please send me emails, but also we can talk uh, during the breaks today. Um, now, we have started this um, uh, lecture serious with uh, a little bit of an overview, a little bit about trade uh, and international trade, and now we'll move on to the first mode-specific lectures, transport modes. We will focus uh, in this lecture and a later lecture on the maritime transport bits, and then there will be lectures on aviation and land-based modes uh, later on. Um, this lecture we will focus uh, mainly on a little bit on the technology side. This is not a technology type of course, but we need to know a little bit about uh, the vessels and the technology. Some of you may know that from previous ex uh, experience, either in work life or in previous studies. But we will then move on to look at the market structure of uh, maritime tra transport, see some uh, trends and key developments, and also discuss some more specific issues related to um, the market power and competition uh, in different sectors, uh, look at the trade patterns and how these are linked to the hub and spoke transport networks. Finally today, if we have time, maybe we'll have to postpone that to the next lecture, uh, we will have a look at international shipping policies. Uh, what kind of issues are on the uh, international agenda related to, to shipping? In the next lecture, um, which will be in a few weeks' time, we, uh, we had to divide it due to some travel arrangements of the lecturers, but uh, we will then come back to some further maritime issues later on and uh, looking specifically at the cooperation with land-based modes, uh, ports and port strategies. As I learned just a few minutes ago, some of you are also planning to, to write about ports, so, so sadly this, the lecture will only be uh, a bit later this autumn. But there is some, uh, some elements about port strategies in, in your curriculum, so you're free to read that, of course, beforehand. Then we'll also look at uh, the link with international supply chains and, uh, and uh, the, the vertical integration within those chains. Right, let's start to get uh, your focus on maritime issues and ask first the question, what is your media image of maritime transport? Is there a media image? When does maritime transport or shipping appear in the newspapers or the websites or... Yes? Any idea? When do you see shipping in the media? Do you ever? When there's an accident. When there's an accident, yeah. Exactly. Um, We should have some lights on the blackboard. Accidents. What kind of media image do we get then? What kind of pictures do we see? Oil spills. Anything else? 
What is the problem with the oil spills generally? What kind of pictures do we see? Animals. Sorry? Animals, Animals, yeah. Birds in particular, maybe. Um, uh, can you remember a specific incident? When did you see this the last time? Or any other accidents which may not be related so much to oil spills? There's been one that's been in the media quite recently. Costa Concordia. where oil spills hasn't been the major issue. But of course, this was a disaster with uh, a lot of people dying, actually. And uh, the trials are going on now, and they are also trying to get rid of the shipwreck. So you can even see a very beautiful time lapse on the internet about the rescue operation that they are carrying out. OK, oil spills, then, uh, from um, you're probably, I think there's been some time since we've had one in, happening in, in Europe at least. Do you remember any major oil spill incidents recently? Okay, where was this? Okay, yeah, yes. Um, what was the name, name on the platform? I don't... Mexican Gulf um, oil platform. Okay. That's not strictly not uh, a ship, but of course it's, uh, it's related to the, uh, the maritime um, activities. So these are the incidents that we see in the media picture. Um, you think people, do, when you think about maritime transport, um, is it at all an important aspect? It's not, I, I think your first reaction was, what kind of media image does shipping have? Well, it's, the first reaction is, it doesn't have an appearance in the media, apart from this negative uh, images. I think ordinary people uh, doesn't think about maritime transport and certainly doesn't think about that most of the commodities that you can buy on the high street here has been transported by ships at some point of time, especially when they come from far away places. Um, and uh, so this has always been a major concern for, for the shipping industry that uh, they are important and very crucial for the world economy, but they don't seem to be on, on people's minds and, and not in the minds of politicians. Um, we'll come back to a few of these issues related to the, the environment uh, eventually. But if we should try to look at what kind of policy issues could be uh, relevant for maritime transport. One of them is obviously related to, to this area, environmental aspects. But these are accidents. Uh, and uh, accidents is not actually the most major problem from an environmental perspective uh, from shipping. It's the emissions under normal operations. They are much bigger than the emissions from these accidents. Uh, and uh, we'll come back to that a bit later in, in this class. Right. Just a reminder, this slide we had in the first lecture as well. Um, and it identifies some of the the megatrends and the key drivers here. Uh, the backdrop for this lecture is the fact that we've had uh, a big globalization of consumption and production structures, which has been enabled to a high degree by shipping. 
We have seen increasingly deregulated transport systems, um, uh, but not in all parts of the world. But this has also happened in the shipping sector, whereas we used to have, for instance, something called line and conferences, which restricted the transport between two countries or on a specific line to one single operator or a few operators. This has now been banned by antitrust uh, governments, so uh, the market is, generally speaking, uh, very free and open at the moment. Okay, we've also had some structural changes in uh, both the demand and the supply side, and we'll come back to this issue in this lecture and try to look at also uh, what kind of geographical trade patterns we have related to maritime transport. Again, uh, there's been a substantial growth in the, the transported volumes, and this we'll see from some of the market figures that we'll also focus on in, in this lecture. So the first part will be very visual. Uh, instead of just talking about different vessels, uh, I would like to, to just uh, bring you a few pictures to identify typical categories, but I want you to contribute first. Um, can you give me some ideas about different ship types? Should have. Just give it a minute and put uh, a few ship types on your sheet of paper, and then we'll do it on the blackboard in a minute. Very quick brainstorming. Different kinds of vessels. I sometimes speak of ships, sometimes of vessels. It's the same thing. Okay, now let's see how many different ship types we can get on the blackboard from the class. Oil tankers. Oil tankers. We usually divide that in two, and we talk about the crude oil tankers, the raw oil before it's been refined, or we talk about product tankers, which is the refined products like uh, diesel or gasoline or, or any of these other um, refined oil products. Sometimes the crude oil is referred to as the dirty market and the clean market. So you will see those words used related to oil tankers sometimes. Um, okay, that's very good. Yes? Container ships. Container vessels, container ships. Um, here we can make several distinctions, but um, one is what we call geared and gearless. The geared ones are the ones that has their own handling equipment, their own cranes, and doesn't rely on a container crane on the port side. Typically, they are the small feeder type of vessels, which would call in the port of Molde, for instance. The small port of Molde doesn't have enough container business to afford its own container crane. So they rely on vessels to have their own handling equipment. Whereas the big ports like Rotterdam will have big container uh, cranes and, uh, and they can serve as gearless vessels. So the big container vessels are gearless. Smaller ones would typically be geared. Great. More ship types. Yes? Okay. Um, yeah. Inland waterway vessels, basically two types. Um, 
what we call barges or proper uh, vessels with their own um, engine. So these uh, have to have some sort of a tow boat or, or uh, a unit that can tow them. Um, so these are without engines. And then you have, of course, different variants of these. Uh, some made for container transport, some for bulk transports, and, and so on. The typical way they look is that they are very low because they need to fit under bridges and so on. Uh, some of them can even lower uh, the wheelhouse uh, to get under these bridges. More. You, you've given us two already. Let's give a chance to someone else here. Okay. Yeah, car carriers, autos. You can say autos in American English, just put. Car carriers. Um, this is actually a subgroup of another, um, a, a sort of bigger group of vessels, which we call what? Yes. Sorry, one. It's for something like Okay, all right. Let's come back to that. But but the, the category that the car carriers belong to, there's a bigger category for any type of wheeled cargo. Mm, well, it starts with an R. Yes. Roro. Vessels, roll on, roll off, and the car carriers is one type of of roll on, roll off uh, vessels. Another one is like the ferries going between um, Oslo and Kiel in in Germany, for instance, which we call ropaxes, which means that they are combined roll on, roll off vessels and passenger vessel vessels, ferries more or less. And then you mentioned what we would call the dry bulk vessels, which are the ones carrying iron ore, sand, gravel, gravel, uh, even grain, and so on. The tankers, uh, the oil tanker, is, is sort of a subsection as well. But we could. Um, add a different kind of tankers which are carrying their cargo in press pressurized tanks, sometimes cooled down. What are they carrying? LPG tankers? Yeah, so gas tankers. Liquid petroleum gas or liquid natural gas, LNG, LPG. But there is another type of tankers which could carry uh, more toxic uh, elements or, or very demanding uh, types of, of car floating cargo, but which is not pressurized like the gas. Chemical tankers. And they have two variants as well, stainless steel ones, which are quite expensive to build, but which can carry any type of cargo. And then we have something called the coated tankers, which has a more limited um, area of usage. OK, so the big categories here. I would say tankers, dry bulkers, roro vessels, container vessels, inland vessels, um, and sort of the opposite of roro, not so much used, is lolo.
which is lift on, lift off, which is the more general cargo vessels, so typically the older vessels, which uh, um, used cranes and derricks to lift cargo on and onto the deck. Basically, a container vessel is also a low low vessel, but it, you never, you usually don't put it in that category. Okay, very good. You seem to know a lot already. Here is a slightly more systematic um, presentation of some major ship categories. Uh, here, slightly different words have been used, like they call this first category of liners, but here you can see the categories that we have identified, container, row, row, general cargo, or low, low, row packs is. Then we have, under the dry bulkers, we have different sizes, some called Cape size, Panamax, Handamax, and so on. Uh, Panamax is easily understood, that's the maximum that can go through the Panama Canal. Um, the other categories have different explanations, but we don't go into that here. The tankers also have different uh, sizes here. And then you have the product tanker, which is the clean uh, type of the market. But these are size groups uh, from the Panamax ones of 80,000 deadweight tons up until the ULCCs, ultra large crude carrier or very large crude carriers. Actually, this category here is now more or less out of the market. So the biggest uh, oil tankers, they were typically built in the 70s and they lasted for some 20 years of operation and they are now out of the market. They were sort of built for a very specific situation in the 70s when the Suez Canal was closed due to a war situation. And then the tankers had to go around the Cape and that made a special market for the very big tankers, but they are, have now all been scrapped. Some of them are used as floating storage devices. Then you have, you could make this list much longer under the specialized thing. The vehicle carriers, we have called it car carrier here. LNG, LPG is category, categorized as specialized here. It could also be a tanker type of thing. Then we have the reefers, which are carrying temperature controlled cargo, heavy lift vehicles, offshore service vessels, which is a, a very uh, much focused in this area, chemical tankers. Okay, um, this slide gives you uh, a brief introduction to the ways you measure the size of a vessel. And this is, these are the most used uh, ways of, of uh, measuring a vessel. You have the gross tonnage, that used to be called gross register tons, with slightly different definition before. And the strange thing is that, that although it's called tonnage, it's actually a measure of volume. So it's the number of cubic meters in all closed spaces of the vessel. Then we have the net tonnage, which is uh, similar to the gross tonnage, but you deduct things, the, the space that is needed for um, the fuel and for uh, the, the crew of the vessel and so on. So it's only the volume available for cargo. Then you have the deadweight tonnage, which says something about how many tons the vessel can actually carry. If we talk about container vessels, they are usually measured by the number of 20-foot equivalency units that they can carry. If you talk about gas carriers, it's the cubic meters. And if you talk about the row row vessels, it's the number of lane meters, meaning that how many uh, meters of cars or trucks you can carry. Displacement is used mainly by engineers now, not so much in statistics. Just one thing about the way things are measured. This, this might not seem very significant, but it is to some extent, because the, the uh, charges, the dues that you have to pay in port will, will sometimes be um, differentiated by one of these measures. And some ports would charge a specific amount per gross tonnage, whereas others would 
say that we charge this much uh, for using the port according to um, deadweight tonnage. And this has been a controversy between the owners of the row row vessels and the container vessels. And the reason for that is that uh, um, the row row vessels has a lot of closed spaces. They have big decks which are covered, which means that they are, uh, they have a high gross tonnage because of the way they are designed. So if the harbor or port dues are measured by gross tonnage, it will sort of favor a container vessel over a row row vessel. Because a container vessel has open decks generally for stacking containers and therefore not so much cross tonnage, whereas the row row vessel is closed. Okay, now we switch to uh, sort of a visual presentation of some of the major uh, vessel types. We have seen in the first lecture that uh, the new biggest vessels of the world is the new triple E class of, of uh, uh, Maersk. Um, this is sort of the different generations of vessels um, and uh, um, some of these are still uh, quite active but even in the feeder market the, the vessels that feed into the big hub ports there has been an increase in the size of the vessel. As I said the, these smaller ones would typically have their own cranes and then we've had an increase in uh, uh, different generations of vessels uh, and currently the maximum size that can go through the Panama Canal is in the, this area between four and five thousand TEUs but they are expanding the uh, Panama Canal so it will probably take twice that size but not the biggest ones and now the current maximum is this around 18,000 TEU AAA class. As I said, the bulk ships are measured in different uh, uh, size classes and, and this is just a presentation of, of those. Um, Suez Max, the biggest that can go through the Suez Canal, um, but uh, they can, if they go in ballast without uh, cargo, bigger vessels can pass through. This is then a typical row row vessel, although in this case it's actually carrying containers on deck. Uh, but you can see that uh, this is designed for wheeled cargo with lanes uh, for driving. And this is not for passengers, this is a pure row row vessel. This then is uh, a pure vehicle carrier. They look very strange, um, more like a building than a, than a vessel. And they are also um, Mm, take up a lot of, of wind if you have windy conditions, so they may have problems navigating due to that. Actually, there was an incident a few years ago outside Japan. Uh, one of these, with, which was full of brand new cars, actually blew ashore. They couldn't uh, keep away from the shore uh, line. But uh, these are the vessels that carry vehicles from factories to customers and also sometimes used cars and they can be used for, for construction equipment and things like that. This then is the combined row row and passenger vessels. Um, uh, typically uh, uh, now looking more and more like cruise vessels, but they have decks which can carry trailers and cars. This then, this old one here is, uh, is one of the, uh, is an example from, from the coast of Norway, a uh, pretty old vessel from probably from the 70s or 80s, uh, and uh, not very big, but can carry many types of cargo either on deck and they have their own crane, uh, and they can also carry pallets in, inside the vessel. Dry bulkers look more or less like this. Um, this was in, is in ballast without cargo, so it's very high up. But here is uh, an example of one which has its own discharging equipment, which uh, can then transport uh, gravel and, and rock materials on a conveyor belt system uh, on shore. 
And this is what it looks like in uh, typically in a loading um, uh, port for uh, dry bulk vessels. This could be a port linked to a quarry which where you extract some sort of minerals or coal or something like that. Then you have a conveyor belt system bringing uh, the rock material out here and something called distributors which could then fill it into the different holes of the vessel. This then is in uh, uh, the, a gas tanker for liquefied natural gas and, uh, and this is uh, under high pressure and also refrigerated. Here's an example of a chemical tanker. Um, this is similar to the ones visiting um, the production facility outside uh, Molde called Hustamarmo, which is uh, producing chalk slurry. Uh, these tankers can carry many different types of, of chemicals uh, in uh, different holes. And the, the way you identify them is that they have a lot of pipelines which can then pump this, uh, these different substances. And of course it's very important to keep uh, these different substances uh, apart from each other and some of these materials are also explosive, so you need a strict safety uh, regime on these vessels. Here is a chemical tanker layout, they would typically have different tanks for different types of cargoes, uh, separated like this. Okay, this would be then a coastal a feeder type of, a, of a container vessel with its own cranes, so it doesn't have to have cranes on shore. This is then an intermediate size uh, uh, 5000 TEU uh, vessel belonging to the Mediterranean Shipping Company, MSC, which is one of the major actors in this business. And this used to be the biggest ones uh, up until uh, a few months ago. This was the E-class of uh, Maersk, around 14,000 TEUs. Here you can see the gantry cranes, which are used for handling uh, containers in the big ports. Uh, sometimes you can have up to six, seven, eight of them uh, working on the same vessel at one time. Very efficient cranes, but also very expensive. So it's only the big ports that can afford them. Super tanker, this is a very large crude carrier. Um, you've probably seen pictures of that. This then is a specific type of a, of a smaller tanker, an Aframax size tanker, but this one is with ice class, which is, means that it's, the hull has been strengthened in order to go through icy waters. Uh, this is probably designed uh, for um, the Baltic Sea, which can have ice conditions during the winter. Here then is uh, one of the examples of the inland vessels. In this case, one with its own engine. And here you can see the wheelhouse, which can then be lowered to get in under the bridges. Another one of the same type, but this one, the, this one is probably for bulk transport, gravel and so on, but this one is for container uh, transport. And here are then the barges without their own engine. And then you can see some sort of a tow boat or pushing uh, but pushing these barges uh, up or down the river or canal. Reefer vessels, they are, they are losing a lot of their business lately um, due to the fact that you can also put reefer cargo, fruit, uh, fresh produce and things like that in reefer containers. So the reefer container has more or less taken over the market from the reefer vessels. Not entirely, but uh, to a large extent. And then this area, the shipyards in this area are built 90%. They are building these offshore supply vessels of different, uh, or offshore service vessels, uh, I should say, in, of different kinds, uh, like anchor handler, handlers or uh, well intervention vessels or supply vessels. You've all seen. Um, Containers, these are just uh, a few of the different types that exist. Uh, some of them are 
Some of them are open top ones with a soft top. Uh, some of them, this is a foldable one where you can, when you don't use it for cargo, you can fold it flat. And you can also put tanks inside of containers. Okay, um, on the port side, just one slide on the handling equipment that you would need. Uh, I mentioned the gantry cranes, the big cranes running on the rails, typically, on the, um, the quay. Uh, then you can have railway wagons underneath it or trucks, so you can move it either directly onto um, the storage area of the port or you can uh, move it onto uh, trains or trucks. Then in the smaller ports or, uh, or uh, in a much more flexible way you can have a reed stacker. Most ports will have that and they can handle containers uh, like this. Um, in some of the major ports you have some uh, strange vessel like, uh, vehicle like this uh, called a straddle carrier which uh, could actually be fully automated or robotized. In the port of Hamburg, for instance, there, there are, uh, in one of the terminal, terminals, they have fully automized uh, straddle carriers, which are moving along some predefined routes without uh, a manned, uh, manned type of operation like this. Forklifts you've all seen for handling uh, pallets. You can have uh, tractors for handling trailers, which are not accompanied by a truck. And then in order to make, you can convert containers into Roro cargo by using a, something called a Mafia trailer like this. And you can stack one or two containers on top of that. And then you can use Roro transport also for containers. Okay, here are the biggest ships in different categories uh, at the moment. Um, the biggest uh, um, military vessel, uh, an aircraft carrier. Uh, the biggest cruise liner. Uh, the biggest bulk carrier. And now the new Triple E uh, class is almost 400 meters. And this is lining a little bit because the, the Nock Nevis was scrapped a couple of years ago. So currently it's actually the container vessel which is the biggest one of the world. Okay. Um, now, um, in, there is one chapter of a textbook from Martin Stopford which is in your curriculum. And uh, in that chapter the something called the parcel size is uh, introduced. The parcel size, th this is not about Christmas presents or something like that, it's about the shipment. A parcel is a shipment in this context. And the three next graphs tells you something about the typical size of an average shipment in different trades. The first graph is related to the coal trade. And here you can see that you have typical shipments in two clusters, two different sizes of the shipments. So you have one here around 60,000 um, uh, tons and then you have another one around 150,000 tons. And as it's commented here, uh, this uh, reflects both the characteristics of the ports involved. Some ports cannot accommodate vessels that are big enough to carry parcels, parcels of 150,000 tons and therefore you will have to use smaller ports. Sometimes it's about uh, trade specifics or the mark local markets. Maybe this coal is meant for a power plant that doesn't have, to, or doesn't have facilities for receiving very big shipments and therefore you need a smaller vessel to service it. If you switch to the trade of grain, um, which uh, uh, is also a dry bulk commodity. You can see that you also have here two clusters, one around 25 tons and another one around double that size. And uh, uh, in that case you'll use a ban uh, Panama uh, size uh, bulk carrier. Third category illustrated here is, uh, or actually two different commodity types, iron ore and bulk sugar. 
Iron ore is transported in bigger shipments than sugar, typically. Um, can you think of a reason why sugar is transported in smaller shipments than iron ore? If we, if we disregard any uh, regulations uh, of uh, the size of the vessels uh, and the ports, but think about the logistics of this and uh, the principles of logistics. Why would you expect smaller shipment sizes for sugar than for iron ore? One key word here could be the value of the commodity, which is if you calculate the value per ton, which is the most expensive of these commodities, you think? Sorry? Iron ore? I think it would be sugar. Iron ore is very heavy uh, compared to the value. So sugar is, is the expensive commodity here. Why, if, if this is so, why would you expect sugar to be handled in smaller shipments than iron ore? Yes? Yes, um, it, could, it could be due to some sort of a, that there is smaller production units, so that could be part of it. But if we disregard that and think only about value, this is not about shipping, it's about logistics basically. Yes? Well, the value of both cargoes might be quite similar, and sugar is a lot more expensive for tonnage. Yes, but um, generally speaking, if, if we sort of think about this as uh, one part of logistics is about production logistics and you, then you would talk about batch sizes in productions instead of transport sizes or parcel sizes like this. Yes? Okay, it could have to do with the production structure, but the fact is that it has to do with storage and the value of the average storage. So, um, you've all heard about just-in-time philosophies in logistics. Uh, the reason why we have had a development of just-in-time deliveries is because we want to lower the, the average storage levels. Because that it, uh, is expensive to have high storage levels. And the higher the value of the commodity, uh, the higher would the price of your average storage be. So the higher the value of the commodity, you would, the, higher, the, the smaller and more frequent deliveries you would uh, tend to have. So this could be one reason why there are smaller shipment sizes, the, the more expensive the commodity is. Okay, it's uh, time for a break.